Did you know that the world's largest particle physics laboratory, CERN, is not just about exploring the universe's mysteries, but also about empowering the next generation of startups with cutting-edge technologies? Imagine the potential when science meets entrepreneurship. Life is beautiful. My dad always used to say, if you only complain in life is weather, you've got a <laughs> life, right? Who's our main customer? It's the entrepreneurs. How do I add value to that particular entrepreneur, a deep tech founder? Where can we do it? So the entire first principle was the only place where I can add value is time. How can I optimize time? How can I get the agreements done faster? How can I give the technology in your hand faster? How can I give you a prototype so you can build your proof of concept? Your job is to make sure that you service your only customer who is the academic. Without them, you've got nothing to license. And if the amount of trust you learn, earn, you will lose in a second as well, right? I'm glad to talk with the kindred spread. Um, science is hard and scientists are truly the heroes. And the more we celebrate, we'll get more scientists coming in. They are the folks who can actually help us solve all our change challenges from climate change to, to poverty to everything else. There is uh, the only hope I have is on science. Welcome to today's episode where I'm joined by Ash Ravikumar, the Entrepreneurship Development Officer at CERN's Knowledge Transfer Group. With a rich background spanning from the United States of America to Australia, Ash is here to shed light on CERN's Venture Connect program. A unique initiative that bridges visionary startup founders with state-of-the-art technologies and a robust network of investors, mentors and much, much more. Stay tuned as we dive into the mission and vision behind CERN Venture Connect the challenges and rewards of the spin-out commercial terms model, the growing tensions between academic entrepreneurs and universities, the role of artificial intelligence in reshaping the startup ecosystem and the future of tech in Europe with a special focus on deep tech. If you're a CEO, investor or just someone intrigued by the fusion of science and business, this episode is a goldmine. Don't forget to subscribe, comment and share. Your support helps me bring more insightful content like this to you for free. Now, without further ado, let's dive into this enlightening conversation with Ash Ravikumar. Trust us, you'll want to hear every single minute. How is life these days in Switzerland? Uh, if, look, um, um, life is beautiful. My dad always used to say, if you only complain in life is weather, you've got a <laughs> life, right? So it got a little bit hot. So the only complaint was about weather. So I can't complain about life. It's beautiful. How is weather, the weather currently in Switzerland? Today it's raining, uh, but this week was a heat wave. Um, And when I complain about weather, people say, well, you're from India and you lived in Australia. You can't be complaining about hot weather. <laughs> But I keep telling them we kind of have air conditioning there when it gets too hot. Yeah. It's, it's, you can't have an air conditioner anywhere. So it, um, it Really? Like, no, no, no air conditioning in Switzerland? In houses, yes. Uh, but son, where I am right now has got air conditioning, so I'm good. <laughs> It's a good reason to stay in the office. <laughs> Then, long uh, True, true. You, you will see a lot more office occupancy during summer. If your office has air conditioning, so yeah. I always thought Switzerland is more on the cold side also in summer. I mean, it's a mountainous area. Where in Switzerland are you exactly? So I um, so I work in Geneva, uh, a little suburb called Meran out of um, uh, out of Geneva. And mm -hmm. I live on the French side of the, um, uh, across the border. So, um, you know, I keep telling, um, I've confused the heck out of my kids. They're half Indian, half Romanian, full Australian, live in France and go to school in Switzerland. So they're kind of United Nations in a way. <laughs> so it's the other United Nations. So basically your kids then speak English? Hindi? They speak English and French right now. We haven't yeah. taught them Romanian and Tamil. Uh, they're six and three. Probably I'll get them too confused. So they're, they're uh, bilingual now. Cool. Cool. And Switzerland is a great place to, I think, also practice German. Yes. And Italian. 
And yes. which language? French? You have? Right. So we live in the French speaking area, right? Mm -hmm. And so the crash and school, pretty much they learned French. Um, they're going to start school. At least my oldest is going to start school. And I think he has an option to learn uh, German as well, which is start in school. So, um, you know, you always try to do over-optimize for what you don't have as parents. Uh, for me, language was a big concern. So I think I over-optimize for my kids to learn every possible language possible. So happy with that so far. My languages is always always a great asset in life, I guess. Absolutely. Understand culture and people and can connect with them and rewire your brain into different thinking strategies. Absolutely. Uh, look, and for the thing is, you know, when I came here, the first learn, first phrase I learned in French was je ne sais pas. Uh, I don't know, right? <laughs> because it's one of the biggest challenge for people to say those three words to saying, I really don't know, but I can find out for you. But right mm -hmm. now, it's, it's, it's not a fact, it's an opinion. Um, I, I keep that too hard uh, when I talk to founders on startups. The first thing is, I have no idea, but, you know, let's go find out somebody who knows about it. Uh, uh, other people tend to hypothesize and, you know, you can't keep on doing it. People will call you out for it. So, so that's where I am at. As you work in Switzerland at the, uh, I never thought about the English term, uh, CERN, Venture yeah. Connect Program. So it's the institution that gifted the internet to society in 1993. So I think this, it's famous for that. And the second one is uh, for physics. Can you tell me a little bit more about the CERN Institute? Absolutely. So it's the other way around, right? So for us, we are famous for physics, particle physics. Um, <laughs> Not in my world, mind. <laughs> <laughs> the World Wide Web was serendipitous, but it was invented mm. because we kind of wanted to see how we can connect information. So the best way for me to look at CERN and what motivated me to come here, um, we are an infrastructure provider, right? We've built the world's biggest machine so that the world's physicists can come and test their hypothesis from all of the member states. We've got 23 member states in Europe, eight associate member states. So, and plus the science is open to, if you're from the US, there's collaborations. You know, I know folks here from Stanford and Slack who spend a lot of time here. So the aim is if you build the biggest machine to do particle physics research in the pursuit of knowledge that we don't know why things exist, then, you know, you can, you can get people together and pursue that, you know, um, singularity towards what is everything made of. And that's what CERN stands for. Um, and for me, it's, The best way to explain CERN, so a friend of mine explained it this way, and it was probably the best way. If I give a child two balls, which has got rattling things inside, and I tell them, find what's inside, and I don't care if you break it, intuitively, they'll smash it to find out what's inside, right? That's what we do, right? We take particles, take them around the uh, two different sides in, a, in the large hadron collider, and we make them collide to say, oh, what's inside? Um, and... and That pursuit, you needed to make it go faster. Mm -hmm. After sometimes you can't go any faster, so the mass increases. So you you go it faster and smash it, you'll get more bits and pieces. So that's pretty much what CERN we do. And to make those, you know, <laughs> to, the, um, to find the properties of the smallest things in the world, you have to be, be build the largest machine in the world. Um, so oh. that's what we CERN do. So basically, my picture now changed. Uh, when people ask me now what CERN is, I can say. They have fun smashing things, and yeah. uh, sometimes they invent the internet uh, when they do that. So exactly, we we smash things, and then we've got so much of info and data. We mm. wanted to do more analysis, more linked documents. So should we we came up with uh, the World Wide Web. So yeah, that's that's a pretty, but rather the the cooler, more, more transitional things mm. where you know high field magnets, which are used in MRI positron emitron tomography pet um so those things are the ones that which which enable a lot of imaging and medical imaging uh, proton therapy um so those were the ones that moved out but not everybody uses an mri or a, a, a proton therapy device unless otherwise you actually are sick or you're a doctor so that in that for we in that world, people understand that right but worldwide web everybody uses so the impact of that is a lot more. Um, and we're proud of that. Uh, we, you know, we made it public. Um, uh, we don't claim ownership of it. It was public domain uh, thanks to certain Berners Lee. So yeah, um, 
I think it was a generous move by the institution to put it in the public domain and not capitalize on it. It would have been also possible, uh, which leads us right to our topic, tech transfer. So you invent technology, enabling technology, and sometimes it makes sense to spin out uh, tech into companies to translate it into products at the end of the day that benefits businesses or and or consumers like the internet. And my question to you is, what brought you into this space? What was your journey up to this uh, point in time at CERN Institute where you are responsible for the Venture Connect program? Um, thank you. Um, it's, um, so I, I'm Indian, uh, the obvious part, um, born and raised in India. And then like most Indians, you do engineering or medicine. I chose engineering. I'm an electrical engineer. I uh, went to the US for my master's. Um, and then serendipitously, I stumbled into an internship at the tech transfer office, right? I loved everything about tech transfer, about the inventions that you get. Um, and then and that pretty much became my career after that. Um, worked at University of South Florida, went to Santa Barbara, moved back to India for four years, and then went to Australia, University of Adelaide, Melbourne, Queensland, and then now it's CERN for four years. So Okay, that's like 300,000 kilometers. It's, it's, it's kind of a round trip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is my fourth continent. And, mm -hmm. and my wife said, no, another continent, I'm traveling alone. So so that's <laughs> what got me here. But, you know, I love early stage technologies and finding out, you know, I mean, the, the mentality is to saying not that this would not work, rather going say like, what if this works, right? What what will happen? And then you go back and say, okay, what do you need to make this work? Um, that's what gives me joy to figure out, okay, this would have a monumental impact on our lives, but the path is not straightforward. Um, so that's what keeps me happy with the spin outs. I can agree on that. I like the space as well to uh, turn technologies into product and help scientists become entrepreneurs, finding the right investors and then negotiating deals with the industry to really change the world. I think without guys like you and your scientists at CERN, Tesla would not have been possible. I think even uh, in the broad range, just to bring up some uh, some simple examples where science played, plays a huge role in uh, changing the world. What made you then design the Venture Connect program at the CERN Institute? What was the reason that you came up with that idea? So for us, um, CERN always had a program to support startups, right? I think it was about 12 years uh, before I came. So I've been at CERN for four years now. Um, so there was a program to support startups and get, help them, but we won't do it. We'll give the tech and somebody else helps them out. Um, what we went back to saying, okay, how do we get a lot more impact about, you know, this startup succeeding? We went into the fundamental design phase to saying, what do we need to change, right? So first principles, what we looked at it was um, looking at the whole value chain. Where can we add value? What is our place to play in it? What is not our place to play in it, right? Where we're really good, of course, as every research lab, we love our tech. We think our tech is the best. We should, because we invented it, right? But um, and that's where we're good at. That's where we can make prototypes. And so it's a little different in that perspective that all our inventions are already used at CERN, right? So if you look at your typical TRL levels, we are on TRL 9, actually we are on 10, because it's mission-critical systems, which is implemented at the Large Hadron Collider already, or some subsystem. So it works, we have data, we know where it breaks, we know how to fix it. But if I take that and go and put it in another application market, you again have to build a TR level, build the, right? And so it, it that doesn't translate properly. And then we said, okay, that's good. That's where we want. Who's our main customer? It's the entrepreneurs. How do I add value to that particular entrepreneur, a deep tech founder? Where can we do it? So the entire um, uh, uh, first principle was, the only place where I can add value is time. How can I optimize time? How can I get the agreements done faster? How can I give the technology in your hand faster? How can I give you a prototype so you can build your proof of concept? That's internally where we can optimize your processes. Externally is every startup needs three things, people, money, and somebody to buy your product, right? 
how can we leverage our networks and who we know and who we can talk so that I can take a founder who's probably a first time founder to saying, you need to talk to this person. They know these people who can help you within that particular industry, right? And so we said, we're gonna connect because I'm good at certain things, but I'm not good at a lot of other things. There are people who are really good at what they do. So you need to meet with them. So that's pretty much what the, uh, the change whole model was. We can't do everything. We don't want to do everything. We find the people who are good at it, and then we connect the folks to them so that you improve the chances of them being successful. That sounds great. What caught my attention in the last couple of weeks uh, with your entity was a post by Michael Jackson. He's a venture capitalist, and yeah. uh, he promoted the Vern Venture Connect spin out program. Mm -hmm. And I was mesmerized when I read it because I saw the commercial terms and mm -hmm. I come from the opposite sides uh, as you uh, I started uh, I'm, I've uh, uh, studied uh, business management economics and then worked at public companies in merger acquisition and worked myself backwards to the startup phase where I started mm -hmm. helping scientists getting mm -hmm. their companies off the ground and mm -hmm. usually when I negotiate with tech transfer offices to get the license, they start their first negotiation position with something like we want 80% equity or we want the highest rate I got was 90% equity. And they always said, guys, that doesn't work. I mean, mm -hmm. you need to motivate the founders because usually the founders have to invest their capital to start the company. And usually first-time founders are not already rich like, like Elon Musk. Um, they don't have a Tesla in the background. Absolutely. They invest their own capital, then they have to raise public funds and then they have to talk to VCs. And in order to be able to raise venture funds, uh, we need to make sure that the founders at the first fundraise, um, when they give away 20 to 30% of their equity to VCs, that they still have the majority. And when the tech transfer office wants 40, 50, 60, 70% equity, it just is not going to happen. The deal is not closing. Um, and they always got pushbacks and people go, nah, you are wrong. Uh, you're not right. And uh, we know it better. And uh, you have to learn about, uh, learn more about this special space. You don't know anything about it. And then I read your model and uh, I can't believe what I read here. Uh, it's, one of the world's best research institutions. And what stuck in my mind was that the only thing that you demand is 2% royalty when the company makes any kind of revenues from the technology. Is that really right? Is this my right, right understanding that I got? That's correct. And that's actually even better than that. It's 2%, but the startup pays us only when the accrued royalty is 20,000 Swiss francs, right? So if, if a startup sells 100 bucks of worth of products, they don't owe us two bucks because we don't need that cash flow. So for them to reach 20,000 Swiss francs, they have to be doing a million in sales. So we really want them to be successful and pay us that. So they need to cross a hurdle rate of uh, a minimum. This is amazing. But why did right. you come up with that, with that model? I mean, it's, it, it stands out in my opinion in Europe. Uh, look, so for me, I've so I've always been within the tech transfer offices, right? So they, everything that you talked about, I was on the other side pushing those terms in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when you try to change it, there's a lot of inertia inside to change as well, right? And so this was my first opportunity to build something where I can have influence to build one. So hence, this was what we should be there. And so we wanted to do it. Um, why? A couple of parts. One is, um, Everybody in that ecosystem, if you think about it, whether it's uh, the academic, the, the VCs, the tech transfer offers, everybody wants the startup to succeed, right? Nobody says, ooh, you know what? This is going to fail. Let's do it. It kind of beats the point to, to take that risk, right? So everybody wants to succeed. But where I find the friction is the fear of missing out a big, good deal. Oh, if it goes for a $10 billion exit, what do we miss out on? Oh, we can't miss out on and then you take one really outlier example and saying in 1942, somebody got screwed because of this happened. And so we can't do it, right? And so none of it actually translates realistically to what it is now and it should change, right? So that was one. Second is, you know, you, the historically where it started on this whole equity part was when startups were, you know, so when nobody licensed your tech, none of the big companies wanted it, 
you have to create a spin out because nobody else wanted. And it was one academic saying, I will prove the whole world wrong because this is my invention, has to get to market. How dare they say no? Let me prove them wrong. So that's how the spin out process started. And by definition, spin outs are poor. So they didn't have money to pay the upfront fee, the milestone, the minimum royalties. And they said, OK, this is the whole deal. Instead of cash, in lieu of that, I'll give you equity, right? And that's where it started. And then it went on greed to say, I got 40% from this startup before. So that's the precedent number. So I need to get 45 from here. So that kept on building on. We are not any different to a university, if you think about it, right? So our research is fully funded. There are 23 member states who pay and eight associate members who pay 1.3 billion Swiss francs to keep all of our infrastructure, our people funded. So we are fully paid for. Um, same with the university, whereas there are grants that cover it. Infrastructure is also paid by grants. So you're not paying for anything for that invention to come in. But then it's more like, oh, I need to get all of this for value capture, which is, is not, in my opinion, it's not right, right? You want the startup to succeed, then make sure you set the right terms for them to succeed. And when they succeed, get a part for what your share of input, that is the IP, to get the fair share. For us, the 2% model, what we are pushing for is you pay when you're successful. If you fail in the process, thank you for trying. Thank you for taking a tech and trying something to do and create impact. We're sorry you failed. You owe us nothing. Right? And that's pretty much where our philosophy is. Well, what, what do you do with the data? I mean, my, my point was always when we go for these royalty-based models, I think it's a very smart thing because you go for the big wins, for the big uh, chunks. <laughs> you get you you spin out startups much faster, much quicker. You can do it basically on a weekly basis with standardized terms mm -hmm. and don't go for the small wins, uh, which are upfront payments or you don't try to rip off the venture capitalists who invest money. You say, look, when you're really successful and let's assume just for the Plump uh, model that they brought up before. When you create the next Tesla, then you get 2% of what, everything that comes in. And this is the huge win. Uh, what do you do in the cases of failure? Do you call back the data and the, the, the IP or do you just leave it at a failed company? Look, so um, we don't assign IP. And you know, and I, I even the universities don't assign the IP primarily because when it fails and the IP is stuck, although your contract says that it'll revert back, you've got creditors, bankruptcy, and the whole lot, right? I don't think that's fair because the IP, you know, somebody tried a startup, it failed, but the IP is stuck there so that nobody else can use it as well. So I reckon so what we do give is a non-exclusive license. I wanted to make that clear because we are um so the challenges with this model right now we have is it's a non-exclusive license. The primary reason is because we are a European-wide organization. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody has a fair chance to use the IP. And I also believe it helps in parallel processing different applications. Say you go on medical device and somebody goes for metrology, somebody goes for instrumentation using one of our laser platform tech. I want all three startups to go. And somebody gets bigger, you can acquire if you want to go into that market or let the other company grow in there because I've given the IP for all three of you to pursue. The, the challenge comes in if the IP becomes in the same market, right? So that's what we want to make sure that, you know, um, uh, we don't we don't license in the same field. What I'm wor working on is, is, is to say, when does it trigger from a non-exclusive to an exclusive? Is it when you raise your first uh, funding, um, so that VCs don't come and say, oh, look, you've got an exclusive, so I'm not going to fund you. Um, or if you actually don't raise money, but you get to your first million in sales where you pay as royalty, then we automatically trigger it to an exclusive. That's work in progress because we anticipate those challenges and we're working on. Um, but for me, the 2% model, right, or this threshold model is ideally what I call success, a startup or a spin-off that comes out of Sun pays us 20,000 Swiss francs every month, which means that we're doing a million in sales every month. That would be a fantastic thing to happen. That's what we want it to happen, right? Because mm -hmm. now you're doing enough sales and what you owe me is less than what you pay on sales. Um, and that's where we should play. 
Yeah, and I think everybody also in the B2B space understands that. I mean, 2% is not much. So if you understood your rights, uh, the 2% model uh, grants <coughs> companies a non-exclusive licensing right to mm-hmm. work in certain areas. Um, yeah. And they can negotiate an exclusive license right uh, once they get significant cash flows into the company. So it really helps starting quick. And yeah. then when venture capitalists come in and really uh, write big checks, uh, you also willing to turn the non-exclusive part into an exclusive part. What are your thoughts about the terms then in this area? So I don't think the the the, the monetary aspect should change, right? I mean, if I'm giving you 2% of non, non-exclusive, you've actually built in to get it to a state where you're raising capital and you have proof concept. I shouldn't go and say, nah, now it should be 5%, right? The, 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 the or, ec- is- or equity. <laughs> Right? Uh, no, we don't. We are zero percent equity, and I don't mm-hmm. think that'll ever change. Right? Um, the, the the fundamental reason behind is, you know, without you, you would have never gotten there. So I'm, you know, as a startup founder who's actually taken the risk and got it to a phase where you're raising capital, you're getting your first B two B customer. This t- takes a lot to get there, and I should not be rent seeking at that point in time. The the revenue should have been ba- only based on the IP. Second part for me, this is where um, um, the challenge and what we're working for is, you know, I shouldn't be now doing another bespoke agreement. The first agreements that we've already got is a standard template. It's the same for everyone. You're working on software, 2%. Your hardware, open source stuff, you know, it's all um, a two-person know-how license. Whatever we have, we'll give, make that as a 2% part. Now, um, the aim is that, you know, the efficiency gains of going back and forth to saying, should it be 3.4? Should it be 4.8? All of it is based on a business plan, which at best is wrong, right? Because every startup has this hockey stick growth, right? Nobody wants to fail. Nobody wants to have mm-hmm. a gag of 1%. Everybody is going to shoot up after year three. So I can't predict anything. That's where the tech transfer offices get wrong is, look at you, you're going to have a TAM of a trillion dollars. You're going to grow at 20% year on year. And you're going to be a $20 billion company in five years. So hence, I need 40% now. Uh, that, but you know that numbers don't make sense. So for us, we don't want to predict on when your revenue would be because you can't and I can't. And this is going to be a guess. So here's a single efficient model to saying license it. If you get there, we'll, we will progress. As a startup, you don't have to spend time. But if you do get to big size, you will have your own good lawyer to come and negotiate and fix those numbers because you have a ton of data to say, what's your cost of goods sold? How much does it cost you to get to market? What's your tax, et cetera, et cetera, is to get to say, is 2% eating up into my margin? Can I survive at 2%? If I can't survive, then there is a fundamental problem there that you have to renegotiate, right? And so that's where we are like, all of those renegotiations happens at a good place because you're either making money or you're established. Yeah. If you're not, let's both sides not spend time and waste resources, opportunity cost saying, okay, I don't like plus 2.1.2. Let's do that and to a or. Uh, yeah, it doesn't make sense for us. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, every, anytime I try to spin something out and the negotiations took too much time, uh, it's just demotivating for the founders. If you start uh, talking about equity positions for six to 12 months, um, people start losing interest in working. Yeah. On the contrary, I mean, I think also at CERN, probably the spin outs very often are in the P2P space with uh, and license the technology at one point in time further to um to, to large corporations. I mean, mm-hmm. then it then it's really easy to negotiate uh because Absolutely. there is money in the company. Yeah, no, no, please go ahead, right? Uh, no, no, I'll, interrupt, I'll, interrupt uh, me, yes. otherwise I kept, I kept just talking. No, no, 100% agree, man, you know? If I'm negotiating with a big, large company, right, you spend seven months because it's a blue sky project. If it fails, they still have a billion euros in revenue. They will survive next quarter. They're worried about if, you know, two points going down in their share price. That's what they're worried about, not necessarily this product, right? So that's perfectly fine. And their lawyers are also built to have those inbuilt delays because back and forth, you know, oh, I write this, I rewrite this. That's okay. But a startup, if you do it in seven months, they're dead. 
all of the work that you did is pointless to get to a point where we got the perfect agreement, but the startup is dead. So yeah. what's the point of doing that rather than saying, look, this start this agreement might not work, but let's see if you survive to a point where we need to change it. Then you do the seven month back and forth with a highly paid lawyer on both sides. So that's okay, but not at the earliest stage, right? And very often you have patents involved and um, they come with a time constraint. I mean, it's 20 years and at the time you spin it out, probably the first five years already passed of the patents, then you have 15 years development time. And if I understood you right, I mean, you said CERN gets 1.3 billion Swiss franc per year from uh, the member states mm -hmm. uh, who support CERN. And when you negotiate an upfront payment, so equity positions, I mean, you're talking probably about 20, 30, 40,000 Swiss franc uh, upfront payments because people don't have money. I mean, you can't uh, rip someone off and say, take out a loan for 1 million uh, when your savings, life savings are 40,000 Swiss francs. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's it's robbing the poor pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, for me, it sounds perfect. and. My next question is, do you also experience some challenges with, uh, in my opinion, an almost perfect model? Uh, look, no, um, uh, thank you for the compliments. I'll take it. Um, look, the challenges are um, not necessarily with the model, right? I mean, um, we're testing it. We have our first guinea pig we went through. Uh, we fixed a lot of the learnings from there. Um, where we get a lot of negative feedback is on like, well, my university is different. We have a different portfolio. Our pattern mix is different. We'll spend money on this. I'm like, end of the day, none of the base constraints change, right? Um, the challenge entirely is on how do I convert that exclusivity to a non-exclusivity, right? Because I can cross my heart to a startup founder and saying, you know what? We will not license this to anybody else in your field because you're going full on on it. Right. But that is me as a person. Right. If, if I get hit by the bus tomorrow and I'm not here, our next person comes in and say, like, you know what? Why? Why are we not going into the biggest player in this pies? And maybe I can license this again because it's non-exclusive. Then that my word to that startup founder doesn't hold good. Right. So the biggest challenge is to define when that trigger happens from non-exclusive to exclusive. Once I can codify that to saying, just like how it's two percent for everyone. Here's how the exclusive will automatically trigger. You don't have to come and sit another agreement to talk through. You raise your first X amount or you pay this first royalty. Your exclusivity automatically, non-exclusivity automatically converts into an exclusivity. So that's what the challenge is and that's what we're working towards it. Sounds, sounds like uh, doable challenges to me. Uh, uh, if it was too easy, there's no point in doing it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the European, the US, Australian, and Indian tech transfer systems. If I got uh, from the intro the right, uh, I remember the right information, you have experience in four continents uh, with tech transfer entities in the academic field. Uh, what are your three biggest learnings from, from these areas? Three biggest learnings. Um, first one, as a tech transfer person inside a university or an academic setting, you are probably the whole collateral damage when this whole debate happens about tech transfer is bad. This is, it's not the institute. I mean, the institution has its own problems, right? Ac academic institutions or tech transfer offices have what I call um, institutional amnesia. They forget how good or how bad they are. However, the academics remember, right? And so mm -hmm. every tech transfer I've been to is I'll get a lecture for first 45 minutes was how bad it was in 1974, how bad it was in 82. Uh, and, and then I'm like, look, I was born in 81. So, but sure, I'll hear the whole winch. And then I say, look, I'm new. I just started. I wanted to help you. How can I help you? So you have to build a trust from baseline because there's a lot of drama, a lot of skeletons buried and you have to start building the trust with the academics. Second best lesson is you are a service provider. Know that and learn that and embrace that, right? Your job is to make sure that you service your only customer who is the academic. Without them, you've got nothing to license. And if the amount of trust you learn, earn, you will lose in a second as well, right? 
And third, there is a big imbalance in power, right? An academic will never get fired. If you're a tenured professor, it'll take a hand of God to fire, it, fire them. But if you are a tech transfer professional, the one goof up, you're out, right? And so those are the three lessons. So which once you learn and embrace it, then tech transfer is fun. That's that's pretty cool. I mean, yeah, ruining a reputation is quite easy. <laughs> so it's uh it's not yes. not tough to do. Uh, <laughs> you, you saw spin out practices on four continents, and uh I always got the impression from this small data set that I have in my life that um we are almost stuck with this equity model and many TTOs um demand it. Is that really so? Which practices did you see in your career? Look, I, you know, I reckon you can look at it as good, bad, and ugly, right? The, the good best practices were where, you know, what I alluded to is a full um, service mentality to saying that I'm going to serve my job is just like a department in an academic university. My job is to service this academics, postdocs, mm -hmm. PhDs. They are my clients. I have to provide the best service. And that comes from tech transfer offices who are not worried about budgets, who don't have to prove about they exist, and they don't have the FOMO of a large university next to them who are doing better, right? So once you have those things, then you go, look, I'm not optimizing for, my KPI is not the number of licenses, my KPI is not number of uh, amount of revenue I get from licenses or maintaining number of patents, but to say, how is the feedback about from my academics? Do they like to come into my office and disclose their invention? So once you have that mentality, and it's a fantastic process to say, okay, the outcome of whether you get revenue or not is going to be five years down the line on what I work I do now. Uh, when I get an invention disclosure to licensing, um, to finishing the negotiation, and then making products and selling, it's going to be at least two, three years, best case. And if it's a spot, spin out, deep tech, it's probably 10 years down the line. So you can't measure that based on my work, but I can measure on whether I'm keeping my customers happy. Do I provide delight to my customers? Those were brilliant practices, right? Um, bad, uh, where it goes to the politics part of it, right? Because the you service the academics who are lifelong tenured people to saying that, oh, I'm going to be here for another 20 years. So I'm going to service the people who are going to be here for another 20 years. The postdocs, eh, not so much. PhDs, not so much. So your service level changes based on who you service. And then and then the, the not so nice part, the, the bad part still is um, when you become the police, when you enforce weird policies of conflict of interest policy, um, and then you go to a poor postdoc who's on an $80,000 salary to, who's trying to spin out his research and trying to do something. And you go and say, oh, the university policy says that you can't do an external venture while you're employed here. So I'm going to report to you. And then you, uh, and then where the tech transfer folks are also on the conflict of interest panel. Where uh, So that for me is, of course, if he had a trust fund and win the lottery, he will quit his job and go do it, right? I mean, you want him to do the startup, to test it, play with it. Um, you as a university lab or trying to do a spin out and figure it out at that early stage, you have to be flexible to do it. That's the bad part. The ugly are the ones you talked about, 90% equity, 80% equity, uh, where the founders get single digit before dilution. Um, and yeah, that, 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 was, that, that is soul crushing, man. Yeah, yeah, it happens sometimes. It happens sometimes. There are some articles on, on the internet. Let's dig a little bit into the, the part where you mentioned that academics are on an 80,000 salary, try to spin out something, and then uh, they get policed or fired from their job because, uh, I mean, it's also, I saw that happening because the institution says you can't do have two jobs. So you need to either do, do this or that and end up then in a startup where they meet some investors uh, who also say you're a founder. You have to work basically for nothing. How do you how do you see it at reality? Man, I mean, so so for me, that's the biggest travesty, right? I mean, uh, so I'll start from the other spectrum, which which uh, it's kind of hit and out for me. Is all of the you know incubator growth? There are more incubators than founders now, which is not good, right? I mean, I think there was a Sifted article saying there's about five hundred plus. Uh, incubators in Europe alone. How, how many? 500 or 400 plus. Um, 500. Roughly around 500 incubators, right? 
Um, I think there needs to be a change to this venture building accelerator incubator model as well, because, you know, I mean, what is the version 2.0? Right now is I get mentors, I, I make you do a canvas, you do validation, and I polish your presentation as much as possible, have a demo day, and success, done, right? Um, that was needed when Y Combinator started in 2005, six. There was nothing there. They started it. And then everybody is still doing that, what, we are 18 years later, right? Uh, but there needs to be a new change. But that doesn't care. I'm hoping Steve Blank writes a new book and then everybody starts doing that, right? <laughs> so uh, so that that is a dogma that exists, right? And then the, that worked brilliantly. Lean Launchpad, don't get me wrong, beautiful methodology, works for software-based SaaS model where you can build MVP, you can pivot, you can do A-B testing. If I'm building a laser or a medical device, I am not going to pivot. By the time I pivot, I need a few million euros to figure out that it doesn't work. And I pivot back to a medical device. So there's no pivot possible, right? But this dogma exists so much that people say it often enough. And they're like, oh, you guys don't know about startups because look at this uh, app that got into the market or this marketplace startup that did that. I'm like, yes, but <laughs> I get into trouble saying it. But it's like saying comparing a monkey and an elephant to saying which one climbs the tree faster. I mean, they're intrinsically different, right? Um, I'm sorry, I lost the train of thought. Um, so that's one. Second, for me, which is very close to my heart, which you, which you said about it, is when people ask postdocs and people to say, you're spinning out, I'm not going to pay you salary for a couple of years, right? I just want to spend a minute there, which is which is a travesty in my head. To become a postdoc, you finished a PhD, right? And then you worked on a junior postdoc, hustled your way, you are the backup to the academic, you take care of PhDs and your research, and you do all of it. You've got 10 years of experience to get to where you are, which means that, say you started at 18, you're at 28 or early 30s, you might have a family or a young family. And then I say, guess what? You, you spend 10 years hoping that you'll get an academic career, leave that, work without salary, because the other 20-year-old who's building an app is doing the same. It, it, it's just not right, yeah? Um, where I see brilliant practices is, you know, what ARPA did in the U.S., um, Activate, Ilangar was started it, now he's running ARIA. Those are phenomenal programs where they say, here's a two-year fellowship to cover salaries from your previous salary. This is to just pursue your research from your lab, take it towards commercialization, where you are guaranteed a stipend, where you're not going to worry about how you're going to pay your kids' school fees, but because you're a postdoc, it's not, you know, you've earned this. Um, for, for me, that is a big missing gap on how to fund that research, right? Now, sorry, this is all the background before your question, man. It's just saying the dual roles, right? I mean, every university struggles with it, and so does San. It's to saying there's a big conflict. You cannot do research and work with an industry because it is conflict. You can't do both at the same time. And I'm like, if that was an absolute conflict, then IP should just walk away every day, right? I mean, it doesn't happen because there is that magic gap in the middle of hustling and making and building something. Um, some of the U.S. universities do it well. Stanford, for example, have a proper, you know, dual role. You can be an academic and still hold a position with a, um, a company. You know, the guy behind Udacity was still is still a professor and and CEO of Udacity, and he came with Bayes before. So there is a lot of education required from the academic institutes to saying, what is the big problem? Why is the sky falling? Because they have two roles, um, but actually let them do it. It'll help in translation a lot more. Uh, not move away from your existing, oh, I'm going to give you sabbatical for three years to do it, but rather than saying, you know what, spend a couple of months with the, with the industry, you'll understand how to build things and you'll understand a lot more on the needs rather than saying that, no, either it's that or that, this or that, black and white. I, I, I find, find it really frustrating. Now let's tell you a little bit at this, uh, at this point. I think uh, a good role model for me is uh, how Bonish Babrai uh, built. He's also an Indian investor. Um, he started, I think, uh, working in the 90s mm -hmm. and mimics the investment style of Warren Buffett. And he said in his uh, interviews that he started his first company while he had a job. And he said he did it uh, very simply. He said, um, 
I was paid to work 40 hours and mm -hmm. I sacrificed my chance of promotion in the company because I said, okay, they pay me for 40 hours. I do what's necessary to deliver my goals, to deliver for my job and invest my spare time into mm -hmm. building the company. And then it says, uh, it's either a success and I can quit the job and move on or I become a more valuable asset for my company when my side hustle fails. Because, I mean, I was managing two jobs at the same time. And when I don't have 60, 60 hours, 70 hours time that I can dedicate to the company, it's a win for the company. How do you see that approach? Look, I mean, th that comes from a place, you know, when people say, well, you should quit your job and do the other thing, comes from a place of privilege, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've got the support circle to do it. And you know, yes, if I fail, I'll come back because I've got enough in a bank account or my parents are rich that can help me out. But if you don't have that, you have that, that, that whole thing of paranoia. I have to push this because there's no bloody safety net for me to do it. This must happen, right? When you have that drive and the fire in the belly, that's a whole different beast, right? And mm -hmm. that's where you, you, you keep pushing for. Now, to on the side hustles, where the biggest challenge there is um, all IP policies on universities and academic institutes talk about um, not a nine to five job where you invent. Your work for hire is to say that you are hired as a professor in electrical engineering. If you come up with an invention during the weekend, it's still owned by the academic institute. It covers everything, right? Um, so it's always a grab all IP. Uh, uh, that because the, the argument is you really can't switch off, right? And you're not a salaried person. So you have, so where I think the panacea should be on is not who owns which part of the IP, right? Um, Nathan Beniak, one of my friends from A Street Capital, he talks about, you know, how the U.S. model is a lot more suited towards alumni and saying mm -hmm. that people come back and donate and want to be part of it. That doesn't happen so much in Europe, um, but it's more, you know, I think uh, founders of Recursion Pharma gave $75 million um, um, dollars to set up a new institute and, you know, entrepreneurship support back to the university in Minnesota, I think. But if you do the calculation, imagine for you to get $75 million in royalty the, and say even a 10% royalty rate, the company should be doing $7.5 in sales, right? That's never going to happen. But if you give them the right support and they become a success, they come back and donate you, which is a lot bigger addressable market rather than trying to siphon a few dollars here and there. So my thing is give the freedom to happen the revenue will automatically come because you would think, okay, you helped me when I didn't have anything. And the more people are there, then the chances of somebody becoming big and coming back and giving back to the community is there, right? Uh, and the counter is like, ah, oh, many people don't do it. I'm like, just because some people are stingy doesn't mean that other people wouldn't be, right? And it's also counting the extreme. So um, I, my personal opinion, unless otherwise somebody is doing with an intent to steal IP or move IP away from which is not theirs alone and they've got other people involved in it, ensure that whoever is involved in is across open for this to be happening. And that's the only consent you need because you mm -hmm. don't know what will become. It's an invention by definition, which means that you don't know what it is. Rather, stopping it and making sure that you have all of the eyes crossed, let that happen and that will actually give you a lot more fruits than controlling it. How how do you see you said there's such a huge difference when it comes about giving back um to the institution between the United States and Europe? Where does this difference uh, in behavior come from, in your opinion? Um, it's not my opinion. This is actually Nathan's opinion, and I fully agree with it. It's also where um I think like there's one part where in Europe you don't pay for education, right? Which mm -hmm. is which is a right. If you're in Switzerland, you have a right to go to EPFL or ETH, sorry, which is the eighth or the 13th best university in the world, right? Um, of course, you need grades to get in, but here's an option for you to go. I mean, same thing with the UK university, same thing with all of Europe and Germany as well. You, you can go into those universities and you don't have to get a huge student loan debt to get in there, right? But which means that it's an entitlement that comes in. I belong to this university because I'm in Germany. I went to this university because I was born there. Um, rather, whereas in the US, everybody pays a lot of money. It's not great that people get into a lot of student loan debt because of it. But 
they also have that belonging of either you know it's the sports team that uh, that you get fascinated with. It's like oh, I'm going to be go Blues all the year, or that you know the alumni society actually gives back quite a bit for that. You know, to saying that okay, I am a Harvard alum. I can go to any Harvard um, uh, lounge anywhere in the world, and people will introduce me because somebody did that before. That seems a bit lacking, right? Just to give you a little anecdote. My cousins, they both are, you know, went to University of Michigan. One is a computer science, another one is a chemist. Uh, nerds by definition, but they've got season passes for the University of Michigan football team. And mm-hmm. they, you know, um, they show up every because they be, they feel like they belong to the community, right? And that is a, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, make football teams out of, or, uh, or uh, university sports teams, but you need to anchor and service those people to saying that you belong here, right? I mean, I don't see people wearing, you know, EPFL t-shirts or ETH t-shirts here, but I can spot an American with a Stanford t-shirt here because they're proud to wear it, right? Or a Duke uh, cap. So that branding and being belonging works a lot different. Um, There are some institutions who do well, but I don't think that, you know, I'm proud to belong to this institution and still exist in Europe because there's there's a sense of entitlement. I I get this. Why do I have to promote them kind of deal? That's my, that's what I I believe Mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I didn't study in the United States. It was in most of the time in Europe and uh, not many universities so that I can uh, run a statistics about it. But what I perceive from the universities, um, I was 20, 30 years ago. There is almost no follow-up from the university. So this community fostering, um, as far as I'm aware of, I don't think it's a European thing. And from what you said, it sounds to me like... Um, the universities in the United States care about their alumni a little bit more and uh, foster uh, and do more activities for them and follow ups and create clubs all over the world where they can attend and meet people. Right. Let's, uh, let's talk about CERN for a minute. We didn't have an alumni organization for, I think uh, Rachel, set, Rachel set it up like five years back, mm-hmm. right? We had a 60 year old institution, right? So five years back, it was a brand new alumni org set up within CERN is because We've got a whole distributed community. Nobody knows what they're doing. We don't know where they are. And there's no way to bring them back in. Now we are 9,000 people strong. That alumni group was zero to 9,000 in five years. is because people were proud to belong to CERN. This gave me something. I like to be in touch with people. So, so for me, that is like a treasure trove, right? I mean, when I get a startup and, you know, there's a, bunch, a startup uh, came out of... Uh, ET at Zurich, and they came here for some work. We used it on a student program before. Um, they were building an AI for soft music. And, you know, I reached to one of our alumni who was, you know, a big wig within the Valley. He was one of the early employees of LinkedIn. And I connected them saying, hey, look, you're building uh, uh, amplifiers for fun. These guys are building start- startup for sound. Why don't you meet? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. So, and so for me, you need to tap into the network to to not to just say, hey, give me some, but it's also like, you're good at this. These guys are good. Would you like to talk? It's like, yes. So you give a value to the, the members too. So alumni is super important. Um, it should not be always to saying, hey, can you give me donation for this new building? Can you do this for, that's what alumni generally does. We don't have a fundraising platform at all for the alumni, right? So it's only, so we run something called a coalitions program. So once every three years, we bring all of the alumni from globally. The next one is in February. We are planning for about 800 people to come here. Sure. And, and so so it's to showcase, here's somebody from CERN, finished up, now is working in space. Somebody is in health tech. So you have a life beyond CERN. And this is what you can do because somebody who looks like you has done that. So I tap on entrepreneurs uh, founders from Al CERN to come and say, representation matters. A physicist who looks like you is now doing a startup at an A level or a B series B level. Come talk to the folks because that will have a lot more effect than me preaching nonstop. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. I made a mistake about having water. So, um, yeah. yeah. Do, you have, <laughs> do you have some water? Do you want to have? Any no, no, I'm good, man. I'm good. I, I the talking comes natural, so I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I mean, if you support your uh, scientists who leave CERN and create companies and don't rip them off early on, but uh, really help them to make money. Um, I, mean, I was just thinking when you have this alumni club and you spin out in future companies and some of your spin outs are already successful 
And the founders had a significant share at the time when they sold their companies. Uh, they are your next investors in principle. Absolutely. You can always connect them. Absolutely. And look, I mean, there, there's been, you know, successful founders with great exits from CERN before, right? And, and, and people before me have gone there and said like, oh, now you're a billionaire. Can you give me some money? And uh, the person pretty much said like, you have no idea how badly I was treated when my contract got over, right? And so now you forgot about it just because I'm rich. Don't come and ask me money, right? Um, and I reached, so when I started the role here, I reached out to those previous founders and said, look, I'm not calling to tell you how good we are. I just want to know how your experience was. And if I could fix something, what would you have preferred I fix when you were here? I got a whole laundry list of what went bad, right? So the whole aim was not to go defend the org and say, we are the best. We know how we're doing. You are wrong. Tell me what I can do for you. Never works. But let them speak and tell what went wrong, right? Because everybody has something that didn't work well. So the whole point was to understand what was the issues and listen, and then you can actually have a chance at fixing and dabbing those. Um, and most of it was, look, it was so hard. It was delays. It was here. So we said, okay, if I can fix time, then I can move the needle and have a significant impact if I can just fix the time and make it into a process that like people will follow the process. And this will work for about 80% of the people. And the other two sigmas on the either one, or you, they, they will be bespoke by definition. You can't fix all of them. But if you can target 80% and fix those problems, you will move the needle big time. And so that's pretty much where we went with, uh, or at least our, our, uh, our startup perspective of validation work there. No, no fixing time. And you don't give uh, all the rights away anyways. I mean, you don't move the IP into the company. Exactly. Uh, you give non-exclusive rights. And I'm pretty sure if, the, if there is no progress, I mean, it's just from other deals that I did, if there is no progress in the company, no money coming in, uh, you claim the license back basically and uh, exactly. do something else. Exactly. I mean, look, and th th this is the thing, right? I mean, um, I used to <laughs> say this, now, there are a lot of companies who are started ups, right? Like it started up 10 years back. It's still the same three people. I'm like, I'm not saying no to it. Yes, if you make a 200,000 euros revenue and you're still never dying, but never alive, that's good, I brilliant. But it's not what you want to have a big impact when you're talking about, you know, startups that change the world. That's not it. That's okay to be in that lifestyle side. But I don't want to give an exclusive for a platform technology for you to have a life uh, lifestyle tech and that you will impact 20 people uh, every year. Rather, I want this to go to reach to billions of people where mm -hmm. you can really, really have an impact, right? So that's where we we focus on is, you know, the impact is what I want to measure, but it's hard to measure, but it'll take years to uh, think. But if you set the platform and the process to go on, then you are designing for success and success is not by, uh, despite the design. So it's, it's designed to succeed is at least what we went through. I mean, the universities that I saw do it exactly the opposite way. They spend a lot of time in negotiating deal terms, which doesn't make things happen and negotiate the entire deal early on. And from what I understood from you initially, you just do what's necessary at the beginning so that they can move really fast and then say to your founders, now show me that you get investment capital. Now show me that you get the industry involved. And when they come in, then let's sit down and renegotiate. And Absolutely. then let's see what we can do with that. Look, and this is the thing, right? I mean, I learned two lessons. One of the lessons you asked, there was a professor who, who spent, I mean, I, I, I give my hats off to him, uh, was my first lesson in proper negotiation. Full, all fields, exclusive license, you know, the deal to precedent case, say, let's say, take a number, 10% loyalty. And he said, okay, so for 10 fields, it's 10%. I was like, yeah, okay. All right. I, okay, good. We're all agreed on the numbers. Yeah, sure. Yeah, all good. Your boss is okay. Everybody's okay. Yes, okay. I don't want 10 fields. I want one field, right? So now if 10 fields was 10%, I want one field for 1%. Because the whole argument was like, I oh, need 10 fields. Each is the percentage. I'm like, I don't want 10 fields. I'm going to focus on this one. I'm going to raise money on this one. Give me then 1%. I, my jaw just dropped. I'm like, oh my God, well done. Right. Um, so, so folks do that well because you understand the inter industry super critically well. Um, and, you know, 
I mean, to be honest, it's two blind people talking about how bright the sun is. Because as a startup, you don't know what the number is. As a tech transfer, you don't have that full, how is this going to fit into that? So it's both of them making up numbers and saying, it's too okay. No, no, two is too big. I want half. Okay, let's decide in the middle and get 1% and everybody is unhappy. So no big deal. Uh, that doesn't make sense. But if you give time, have an option to say, let's explore this. You go figure out your CapEx, OpEx, cost to go market, all of the numbers. And then we together can look at it and say, okay, if I charge you 5%, your margin's not going to be there. You won't sustain. 2%, you will have margins. But how about we keep the 2%, accrue it to 100,000 and then pay me because at that point in time, you'll be really successful to pay me that. So that's where you, if you want more startups and more successes, set them up for success rather yeah. than... My, Getting two dollars out of them every week doesn't make sense. No, this this makes absolutely sense. But you say it's um, setting them up for success to move quickly, and rather than talking about fears and dreams and what could potentially happen, you just say to them, uh, "Show me your reality in two years, and then we talk." <laughs> exactly right. I mean, in two years, and this other thing, right? In two years. The other argument used by most tech transfers is like, what if in two years there's a large company who can move this technology faster? If I give this, then I'm stuck, right? My argument on counter is, say if I license exclusively to a startup and there's a big company who's going to come and say, oh, I would like to use it, send them as a client to your spin out, which means they will make more money. You're getting the royalty either way. Why do you want to cut that startup because it's a better deal rather than run it through the startup? Because then it will be a success. It will mean more research will come in. So it's more people who are looking at the short-term part of it and not looking at if this goes well, uh, it will become a gen and tech, which means the whole ecosystem will grow, which means there will be other startups that will come in or a Google that what effect it will have on Stanford rather than saying, okay, I'm going to give you and then I'm going to cut your bigger customer and give them another license. It's like... Uh, shooting your foot, uh, everything else in the process. Um, I mean, anyway. I mean, I mean, it's it, it, it's the outlier technology. For example, I mean, gene editing. Of course, the pharma industry is interested in getting the entire technology early on. But mm -hmm. when I look at the reality of technology that comes on the market, there is a small percentage that has the potential of being one of these breakthrough technologies. The majority are. Improvements, necessary improvements, great products, great teams, but not these outlier cases. And I always smile when I see the same process from tech transfer officers. The first round is always to the industry. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to the industry, they always say, we don't want early projects. They are, we can't do anything with that. They are too small for us. We want a proof uh, in the pharma industry, which is my industry that I work in, it's mostly clinical phase two data. In other industries, it's a minimum viable product, a working yeah. prototype, and not uh, a bunch of patents. But the tech transfers always go to circles to say, okay, let's go first to the industry, and then as a second solution, let's do it to startups. Is this just my perception, or is it also... No, and it's, and it's also how the KPI is measured, right? I mean... Um, even the start, even all the uh, tech transfer officers who, who claim we've got so much of startups coming out, if you ask them, on, first option would be to license it to a company because they got money to put in. You'll know it'll develop faster and um, you know better chance of success. Um, uh, but at least that's because of precedent cases. Now, for me, I was always uh, my friends within tech transfer. My old officers used to call me the dead sciences guy. Because and nothing was living, right? Uh, sensor software, and there was all the pharma, small molecule, big molecule, devices, and all of that. And there was always the split. 90% of the revenue came from them, right? Mm -hmm. um, from the licensing deals and you know, contract research that were coming from big pharma and you know, um, spin outs as well. Um, and whatever royalties we get will be the 40,000 here or 50,000 there, and they were talking millions. I mean, the previous university I was working with. We had like $27 million coming in every every year on royalties for a vaccine, 
right? So that's your home runs that all of the tech transfers are built on is on uh, life sciences because the market understands when to license it. They license at a provisional stage if you have data or if you get a publication in one of the major publications, they look at it. From a software or a sensor, by the time I get a patent issue, the technology would evolve so much, the patent doesn't make sense anymore, right? And so that's where there's a higher degree of spin-outs created from there. And so hence, you know, you keep on like, oh, software easy to commercialize. We should have 40% royalty on it because it's shilling crap. It's all from people who have never coded, right? Or never done an enterprise sale on the software. Mm. Um, but it's more, it's not the IP on how developed it is. It's how you're going to actually sell it. What are you positioning? So there's a whole lot of that comes in, which doesn't translate well back into it because you're trying to catch up to the life sciences folks on the numbers. And then you try to squeeze the last dollar of it, which is ridiculous. I mean, you, you mentioned before in what you said um, that the hope is of tech transfer offices that the technology develops faster when it's uh, licensed early on by the industry. And from my industrial experience, I doubt that. I mean, you have a champion very often in a big company and then they get the chance to get promoted to a better job. They just mm -hmm. move on and technology doesn't have a champion anymore and is stuck in I the operation. When I look at a startup and let's say we have a poor founder, financially poor founder, who mm -hmm. sacrificed his time to get a PhD, become one of the brightest minds. And usually in uh, research institutions, they don't become billionaires. So mm -hmm. when they're on a salary, when they spin something out, uh, they know, I mean, if that doesn't work, yeah. um, there is no way back. So the only way is forward. Exactly. And when you are lucky and you have a founder that has the luxury of growing up uh, privileged with rich parents, set up foundation, you can also say, look, I mean, you can invest a million and uh, bring more skin to the game. So if, mm -hmm. in my opinion, early stage technology are better off with small teams. What is your view on that? 100% agree, right? I mean, the same way that you said, right? I mean, if you, if I license to a big company and the internal champion moves somewhere else, the tech is there, right? And I mean, most of the royalty agree, uh, licensing agreements, the fear is, oh, what if you shelf this technology, right? And so that's why you put minimum royalty requirements to saying, you know, you pay us $20,000 every year, irrespective of how much royalty you get, because if you get to 25, you pay the 25. If you get to 15 as an actual one, you pay 20 because you're not putting enough effort to, to actually license this faster. But those terms also flow to the spin out one. And my, me being against it was like, I mean, that large company has got, 20,000 products or five different drugs in different phases, right? They have the luxury to shelf. Mm. The startup does not have the luxury to shelf because if they shelf, they die, right? Yeah. Um, so, so that whole minimum royalty concept of having it for spin outs, it doesn't make sense because it's just a hang on from existing large company licensing models of like, what if you don't do it? Look, if I don't do it, I don't exist. Um, that is where, you know, a lot of those terms needs to go out, right? I mean, even in equity transactions, I used to do this and I didn't, I said this loud and didn't make friends, was you want 20% equity in my startup? Great. The same tech say Apple will license it too, right? Why don't you go ask 20% of Apple? They'll ask you to get out of the door as quickly as you finish saying that, right? Mm -hmm. If that doesn't hold good for Apple, why does it hold good for you to ask 20% of my company? Right. So, oh, because they're two trillion. Of course, Apple can sp spend billions in making this tech go faster. I'm like, what do you think I'm trying to do? The same damn thing, right? I'm going to try to raise money and build this, quit my job, lose my mental health and go do this. For that, you want 20 percent of my company, whereas a big 800 pound gorilla, you won't ask, you know, a thousand shares of Apple for in terms of royalty because Apple would never give you that. Right. And so, you know, you won't get out, get any of that. So you don't do it. You know, you can get away with it. And so you ask it. And so that doesn't that is not fair. The one lesson that stuck from a management training 20 years ago in public companies is uh, buy finished solutions from the market. So I, I would not be so confident that when a big company licenses a patent, that they develop, uh, often they just want to get the patent off the market so that oh, the can develop on that. <laughs> it's like, you know, and the other thing, one, one happened in my, we license something uh, and the, the company that licensed had a product and their margins were 80% on the product, right? Mm -hmm. So this new one will come in 
but they won't get the, you know, I mean, they'll have to cannibalize their own product and lose 80% of the margin. It's so like, oh, we'll have minimum royalties for you. Otherwise, you know, the you, you, so that you don't shelf it. So like a oh, minimum royalties, 100,000, sure, I'll pay it because I'm making $20 billion industry in there with 80% mm-hmm. margin. I'm not going to lose that. I don't want my competitor to get it. I want exclusivity. There is no termination till I, as long as I pay, you have to give me one year. So they went in pretty much blocking everybody else. And yeah. that happened, right? I mean, um, but uh, look, I mean, if I was on the other side, I would do the same. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> absolutely. But um, sometimes it's better to, to startups. Let me let, let's switch a little bit to the ecosystem. I mean, I have now the chance to talk to someone who has seen basically the whole world. Uh, you said four continents. So yeah. there is not not much open. Um, when I was a student, it was the 90s and Europe basically was winning. So mobile industry uh, evolved in my European training out of Europe, of course. And we had great bra- we had great brands, great technology. The internet was a European invention, <laughs> thanks to your institution. Um, now we have 2023, and I, as a European, can rant about the continent. Um, in my opinion, we failed in technology. There is not much going on. And in translating technology into products and spinning out companies. And the usual lesson that I give startups when they approach me, I say, look, I mean, you can start a company in Europe. You get great support. You get great grants. But just be aware that if you can't license it early to the industry or sell the company, you won't find venture capital in Europe. And when you get stuck in Europe, uh, you face very quickly at that end financially. So you need to be aware that at one point in time, you need to relocate to the United States. Mm-hmm. My question to you is, is my view of Europe in comparison to the United States uh, too harsh on the system? Uh, are we much better than I perceive it? And I'm just Austrian negativity that plays, uh, plays into my perception. Or is there really this huge difference between the ecosystems in the United States and the European one? Look, so for me, you know, I mean, I'm a newcomer to Europe, right? I've been here for four years, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, whatever I thought about Europe was, you know, single economy, easy movement, all of it looked fascinating for me, right? Um, but for me, where I where I find the challenges is just so fragmented, right? One one end is like, oh, we need to, Europe needs to. Um, beat USA and beat China in, in, in technological advances. Brilliant. But when it comes to implementation, they go into national borders, right? Right. For me, it's more like, should you then compete with Texas, <laughs> right? As, as, as France, should you compete with California, right? Germany, should you compete with California as a state? Because that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Uh, where I get frustrated is there's a lot of reinventing the wheel. Right. It's more like, okay, I've got a photonic center here. You get a photonic center there. Let's let's do the same thing in both countries because then I spend the money in my local economy. I get more jobs here. That's fine. I understand the politics and how you want to 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 fund in local ecosystems because you don't want anybody left out. But then again, you won't be able to compete with a large single unified country which can move at a really fast pace. Right. So for me, the, the that's one. Second, um, every, you know, there was an article recently that said the GDP of EU put together was larger than the US before COVID, right? About a couple of points up. But now US has just gone, right? I mean, take about all of the technical advances that are coming out, right? All of the big ones coming out is, you know, I, you, you tend to question where is you EU leading in, right? Within you know all the new deep tech coming out regulations. Uh, I knew they were going to say that, right? <laughs> um, um, I, I I find that fascinating, right? At least from a mindset of how much people follow rules blindly um, to saying that this is a rule. I'm like, no, this is a man-made rule. This is not rule of nature. Laws of physics respected. Don't drive on the wrong side. Yeah, that's common sense. But anything else. Either as a bendable law or breakable law. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so, but for me, it's you know the last good big deep tech company in my hand was DeepMind from uh, from the UK. Uh, mm-hmm. Still can't consider European Union, right? But 
I mean, now they are part of Alphabet. They're an American company for all I consider, right? So which was the biggest acquisition for one of these tech companies from Europe? I I struggled. Maybe in the biotech space, I yeah. don't know enough about yeah, it. We have just, uh, let me uh, briefly interrupt you there. I mean, we have BioNTech, for example, yeah. uh, mRNA, mm -hmm. but they went public uh -huh. on the Nasdaq. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah, they work in Europe, but uh, the license deal is with F Pfizer. It's not European. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have gene editing, for example. Emmanuel Charpentier was in Vienna and mm -hmm. uh, her partner uh, in this business in CRISPR therapeutics was Rodger Novak. He was also based in Vienna. Then they founded a company in Switzerland and moved to Boston and got listed on the Nasdaq. So mm -hmm. every bright mind, in my opinion, that we have uh, ends up uh, in the United States and probably in future, either India or China on, mm. on the way east, if we don't ruin the relations between the European Union and India and China. Or, or at least, you know, or at least the US market listing uh, conditions change, right? Mm. Right now, I agree. Right? If you want to list somewhere, you know, you go list in NASDAQ because the tech stocks are, uh, you know, rallied a lot there and acquisitions happen a lot more there. Or at least even if it doesn't, the press behind it is fantastic. Right. I mean, I love the Americans for two things. One, they promote themselves great and they promote other people in the process as well. Right. Um, even, you know, there's this article about ETH Zurich about how good they are. You know, Einstein's old stomping ground is creating so much as pinouts. Thank to Swift Tech that came out. Otherwise, nobody would even know that was happening in, in, in your own backyard. Right. So things are changing. However, the existing mindset of um, and in the, the one point you you touched upon, that's where the, the, the VC money comes in, right? I mean, if I'm a U.S. investor, I'm going to put your money in late stage growth fund. I I want you to have a Delaware C car because that's the structure I know. You might have a U.S. GmbH or whatever entity you have. You create a C car, spin it out because that's what the money will come to. Because that's what my LP says. I will not invest in another entity I don't know the laws of, right? And so, if you don't have capital, and I think there's a dearth of growth stage funds here, especially on deep tech. Early stage, there's you know now a lot more coming up, which is good. But late stage, you know, you probably have three or four. Um, uh, deep tech focus, you know, large ticket uh, uh, or other. Now that's the VC entities. Else is all family um, uh, funds that actually invest in those. With the same terms, you'll get 20 different options in the US, right? And you can't tell the startup to saying, well, you know, you're European, you have to stay here. I'm like, well, you have to survive. You have to get money or you have to list. You do what is required to succeed. So, I think there's a, a ton of things that can change and needs to be done for startups to stay here rather than just evoking the nationality or or pride of, you know, you have to be here. Look at the great skiing you can get here that, you know, you list in NASDAQ, you can come in your private jet here. So, you know. <laughs> the, the, the valuations are much higher than. Uh, a business yeah. angel had in, on my podcast uh, in January, uh, he's in Los Angeles and investing in San Francisco-based companies. Uh, he said that business angels get tax breaks when they invest in US-based companies, which is a big reason also to invest only US-based companies. Um, what I would like to see is uh, Europe uh, evolving to the level of the United States, where it is now. In my opinion, in the 90s, we were on the same level. Mm -hmm. Now here is the United States and here mm -hmm. is Europe. And China is somewhere in between, in my opinion, but mm -hmm. more close to the United States. You saw the whole world. What needs to change, in your opinion, to make... Uh, the deep tech field more attractive for deep tech entrepreneurs to have them stay here in Europe and not walk away towards Nasdaq and San Francisco and Boston and all the other beautiful places in the United States? Look, so for me, there is, you know, one thing which I loved about the US is how many folks were happy to roll up their sleeves and help you. Right. Without, I mean, you, I mean, people talk about how Silicon Valley being awesome is because people say, oh, you're good. You need to talk with these three, four people because, you know, you need to connect because you both will do amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. I find it fascinating here because I'll talk to somebody and they'll say, well, we have, we do only this, you know, for, I can talk about Switzerland. I can, we do only the French speaking area. Or we invest only in the German-speaking area. And I'm like, look, for a country of eight million, 
you're talking about 1 million people and that's what you want to, you know, or you're marking that area there, which for me is, you know, um, not helpful. Mm. But in the process, you find people who are mega connectors, right? I mean, so my story, I came to, to Europe, uh, July 2019, mm. right? A heavily pregnant wife. Our daughter was born in December. So first three months, we didn't go out much. You know, I couldn't travel. And then uh, March COVID hit for two and a half years, I was home, right? And there was no way to build a network, meet anybody fresh off the flight. And I reached out to a few folks, you know, thankfully to Zoom. And they're like, okay, good. You know, you and I hit the same terms on how we talk about commercialization and deep tech. Here's the 20 people who you need to meet, right? And so there are these mega connectors who want to bring everybody in. It needs a lot more. Where it is right now is if you have a successful founder in deep tech, they will go and do in their local ecosystem alone, right? I mean, I'm a founder, successful uh, founder in Vienna. I will touch all of the startups in Vienna or you're from Southern uh, Federal of uh, uh, of Austria. I do, I do Eastern or Western Austria. So that doesn't make sense, right? I mean, um, where I loved about Australia was since it was geographically isolated and a very small continent of 23 million people, every founder was, okay, I can't survive from selling only in Australia. I need to start selling outside. So they were global from day one to say, how do I get customers? Where I see a lot more problems here is like, I'm a French startup. I'm going to sell in France. I'm like, great. You get your validation, but there is, you know, your ICP, your ideal customer profile will be European Union fully. Go look at everywhere else you can sell, right? Um, and so that's that's a little bit of a, a mindset issues and and the, you know, people who can actually connect don't do enough of. That's one. Um, for me, where do I see deep tech? I can talk more about what I'm, Close to, you know, there's a ton of amazing work coming out of in the photonics area. I know Fraunhofer is doing brilliant. Uh, EPFL is doing really great. Uh, Professor Tobias Kippenberg is probably, you know, he's got like five spin outs coming out of his research. So there are a lot of people pushing um, and doing stuff, which is which is a lot more commercially oriented, which is, which is um, refreshing, excited to see. Um, and, you know, um, folks like Sprint in Germany, right, who is the DARPA of Germany and ARIA, which is like built on the DARPA in the UK, they are now, you know, taking a lot of the learnings, what worked in the US, why DARPA worked, how to do it fast and, and bringing those learnings here, which which is exciting to see. And I that will see how the next five years will pan out, because now you're not going through the same funding mechanisms existing. It's more to stay. Okay, I'm looking at long storage batteries as a challenge. Everybody apply two page application. I'll give you a million euros to do a proof of concept, simple agreement, go do it. That is that is refreshing. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. So you see hope basically for oh man, always, always hope. Um, otherwise it would be too depressing. Yeah, should we not remodel okay. the European Union? I mean, Switzerland is outside <laughs> European Union, anyways. Uh, <laughs> Um, we com communicated briefly over a post on LinkedIn um, where the author of the post highlighted uh, artificial intelligence in in patenting. In patenting, mm -hmm. um, how do you see the influence of artificial intelligence on the startup ecosystem? I mean, so look so for me. There's um, just on AI, right? Um, there's enough doom and gloom about, oh my God, we need to regulate this. This will take over the world. Yeah, Terminator um, is Austrian. <laughs> well, I know. <laughs> uh, and I lived in California when he was a governor too. Um, uh, and so for me, I think the the doom and gloom is, 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 I'm not a huge subscriber to that, primarily because AI is a tool, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the fallacies and the faults lie in the human nature, not on the tool, right? Uh, the, the analogy for me is if I invent a pen, everybody writes beautiful, great, but there's going to be one guy who's like, oh, I can stab somebody with it. Just because somebody stabs somebody with a pen, you cannot go regulate the pen rather than you know help with mental health issues and what triggered that person to stab, not going saying, oh my God, pens are now you know dangerous devices, capture them on, uh, on the airplane. That kind of beats the point. And I think the overreacting on regulation on AI is that to saying that, oh, we saw a movie about Terminators or killer robots or this or that, that AI would do. AI is a tool, 
right? Mm. It's not there where it is, a, you know, fully sentient, where it can take over the, you know, I mean, you use any AI tool, you still have to have the input. If it does get there, I mean, I don't think there's problems yet by as as how people are making it fictionalized problems, right? Um, and to the post on patenting, right? Um, why I like it, um, um, I, I say this often, um, if you ask me to define an inefficient system, I will say it's the IP patent system. Right? Really? Why is that? Why is that? It's designed for lawyers, by lawyers. The only people who make money are the patent lawyers for drafting, filing, prosecution, litigation, licensing, everything. It's supposed to be for inventors who can draft and write their own inventions and file it, right? Mm -hmm. When the patent system started, it was for mechanical inventions. I think one of the first thing was the, the machine gun that can shoot, right? And um, that had the first description behind it. It worked there. Industrial revolution, it worked because it's still mechanical parts. Then you got genes, oh, chemistry, wow, how do we hold it? Computer science completely failed. Now we are trying to fit into a static document all of these new inventions, but the static document hasn't changed, right? Um, so, so for me, <laughs> the patents are brilliant tool. That is the only tool we have right now to protect inventions. So that's the system. Well, anybody change it? Not the IP regimes. We go, EU, EPO or USPTO is not going to do it because you're paying patent fees and, you know, VPO made 9 billion euros in revenue. So they're not going to go and say, hey, this system doesn't work. Um, right. So for me, where I think there's a difference between IP strategy for startups is that what happens after you file a provisional application? Who reads it? Nobody. Right. For whole 12 months, nobody reads it. It's just like you have a priority date as the placeholder. After 12 months, you write a full detailed, full application and a PCT. Who reads that? Nobody still. You get an assigned inventor or you do an ICR or an international search report, ISR, and then you get an assigned uh, an examiner who will review it and say, no, I don't grant this. This is uh, uh, whatever rejections are novelty. But for the first 12 months, if, you, if I draft it on day one, I'm spending 7,000 euros or 8,000 euros or 10,000 euros to for draft a full claim set. Nobody reads for 12 months. What is the value of that 8,000 sitting in the patent officer, the patent lawyer that you paid for, or use that to actually develop it? And then within a year, you can actually raise money and then pay for the best patent lawyer to redraft it either way. Right. Mm -hmm. That's where I love these patent tools is because you're the inventor. You've written the whole thing. You know the invention back and forth. Right. You give it to a lawyer, patent lawyer, and they are beautiful at drafting. Don't get me wrong. If you hit the claim set number one, beautiful. It's a piece of art. Nobody understands it, but it's just convoluted. Right. But if an AI system can spit the same thing, you're saving eight grand. And then at that point in time, you'll have raised a lot more money to do it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I tried, before AI, I tried to do the human part of it. And I told them that was a stupid idea, but I'll still say it because I believe in it. I worked at a university. We had a law school, right? And we were training patent lawyers to become patent lawyers from the law school, right? After they finish it, they will become, go to one of the big law firms and charge us back $500 an hour for drafting the patents. I said, look, how about some of these patents that we didn't think it'll make it or the patent committee didn't want us to go ahead with the filing? Why not I get the top three students from the class to draft it and we'll take a punt and file it ourselves for one year. It's $110 to file. Let's file it. If it doesn't work, if it doesn't commercialize, we let it lapse because we are not going to file it either way and would have been published tomorrow. But It'll help the student to say, this university trusted in me to do it, put it on the CV saying that I've already drafted and filed one. It'll get a better job for that person. And guess what? Every year, we'll at least have three good students who will come and do it. So like, oh, no, no, the risk and what will happen. I'm like, the risk is not filing. You, There's no risk. It's already published. At least you now have one year. Rather than paying 10000 to have one drafted filing, I can have 500 of it and give one year to saying whether somebody will commercialize it or not, right? And so for me, when I see these AI tools, it means that you don't have to spend that money at the earlier stage. You can conserve cash. For me, I always think about startups as how do you conserve cash flow? Um, you don't want to spend on things that you shouldn't be spending on rather than 
put it on your product to get the validation. So that's where I am super excited about a lot of these AI tools coming in, which gives the power to uh, you know an inventor. If you can invent it and have a publication published in Nature or wherever, you can definitely write a patent application. Yeah, I mean, what you said is um, it definitely helps students to get the reps in, uh, to get good at something and uh, getting trust from the institution that they can do it is definitely good for their personalities. The question that I always had is with the patent system, I mean, you mentioned that it's very old and that it's sometimes not really suitable for our times. Uh, I mean, it's, we are now in 2023 and I think the first patents uh, 200 years ago. That's yeah. Uh, very very old um i think there is enough uh room for improvement in there and you mentioned in what you said that institutions often fear when they don't engage patent lawyers that they risk something is there really such a high risk that you can do in these early phases something significantly but wrong but it's you know it's more about the risk about oh what if you if if there's a disclosure and it's not covered in the original patent or the claim set is not written well, um, but it's it's not I mean it's a fear right it's not it's not rooted in logic it's more mm -hmm. um, you know it's a counter argument to saying that we should not do it because this might happen. Um, my my Australian boss used to call that as George Bush strategy to saying, if you sell fear, you don't need to have like, you know, remember WMDs was a big thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's because, you know, de you know, definitely didn't exist. But if you're scared about something, and if I say that it's a, a fear enough times, and then it keeps on telling through every tech transfer generation to say, oh, in 1950, somebody had a lawsuit and it was not properly done. And hence we lost the lawsuit. Oh, big, big, no, no. So we need to do it. And so it's not realistic because end of the day, you don't go to court. You don't mm -hmm. do a patent process infringement from a university, right? I mean, how many infringement studies happen more in Europe? Not much. US, yes, there are a lot of lawsuits. But even then, patent infringement takes a lot of money and a lot of proof to do it. Rather, it's better to settle. Uh, and most people settle because either you, I spend two million and you spend two million on patent litigation, or I'm going to end up spending two million in royalties over the next ten years. Let's do a cross licensing agreement. It's much simpler to do, right? Um, and I, my advice to startup founders is: if you're a young startup and a big company sends you a cease and desist letter, that's the best validation you can ever get, right? It's mm -hmm. a two-person company doing with one patent, and they're scared with what you're doing. Take that to either the VC or the biggest competitor. They will fund you because they've got a bigger patent fight going on. You will just be one more patent in that fight. Um, so anyways, I, I digress on that. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, negotiation is always a good good solution before taking it to the court, and most people are willing to to settle it uh, much easier. And it's often sometimes only renegotiating terms so mm -hmm. that uh, somebody gets uh, a chunk, or a little bit of something. Um these patents are really an interesting part, especially of the air part. What I was thinking when I read that post is, um, what if then startups start writing business plans with with uh, with artificial intelligence? It's like just automated. I mean, you said the benefit of the patent system is to automate uh, with artificial intelligence to automate the process so that you make it just quicker. It makes sense in the patents because it's administration. The value that I see in writing business plans is not so much uh, that you have a business plan at the end of the day, but to make sure that the startups need to go through the thought process and tackle at least every corner once so that they get aware of, oh, we need a market, oh, we need mm -hmm. customers, oh, we need some employees, where do we get the money from? And when we don't walk them through this process, um, I sometimes saw that... Uh, they just had blind spots. They say, yeah, we developed the technology and two years later, they said, damn, uh, we forgot about the customer. Nobody wants to buy it. And Europe has a, a lot of these technologies. How do you see the value of artificial intelligence in writing business plans for startups? Look, so for me, I, I, you know, I mean, I'm going to sound like an old record, right? It's, it's a brilliant tool. Mm -hmm. right? As long as you know what you're going to ask the tool, it'll help you. Right. Mm -hmm. Just because I had a feather, you know, the old quill and an ink pot, not that I'll become Shakespeare. Right. You still need to have the skill set to write what you're going to write with it. Right. AI is that tool. The large language models give based on what you want to query. it, Right. So that is absolutely you can use it for any particular thing. 
provided it gives you that efficiency gain, right? Rather than sitting it and prompting it and saying, you know, X, Y, Z, it's not going to help you. However, if it says, give me the list of every, uh, you know, diagnostic company with their market share, the next last licenses from their 10Q reports, if you plug it in, and then it gives you tuck, 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 it saves you reading 100 documents. That's brilliant, right? Or if I can plug it into every nature publication to say, hey, this is my molecule. Can you look at where else it has been looked at and what are the other alternative things? If it gives a summary, brilliant, right? So, uh, you, you know, I mean, you always look at what peers you have to not to become an entrepreneur. One of mine is to be an entrepreneur in my head is where I don't, or, you know, I've given a lot of peers, you have to be the best manager of your own time right? You have to manage account sales, blah, blah, blah. You should have complete control on your life. I'm super chaotic, right? I need somebody to, to help me with manage it. Otherwise, you know, I mean, imagine hiring, getting the contracts done for all of that seems a little bit for me daunting. But imagine if AI can fix those and give you as a crutch to say, hey, look, you're not good at accounts. This will manage automated sending for your invoices, follow-ups. Uh, building a sales pipeline. How do you qualify leads? When when those tasks can be automated, then it feels like, okay, I let this do it. And then I'm the human where I can go execute on it, but I'm getting a whole feed of the manual redundant work that is getting optimized, right? And for me, where AI in science is where I'm super optimistic, not necessarily the LLMs. It's like show gimmicky ones, right? Um, Think about material science, right? So for me, superconductors, we use superconducting materials. Mm -hmm. so it's, oh, it's used like, you know, rubidium, cuprite, barium, cuprite, or whatever. That was all done by, oh, I'm going to put some rubidium. The molecular structure meets with, the, you know, uh, barium and cuprides. And yes, we know how this works. If I have really good foundational models of materials, and then I can say, okay, here is Yipco, here is Ripco. These are what will be potential superconducting material combinations or it's a super hard alloy because the system chucks on it. Then you do the experimentation, characterization, validation, all of that. Then it cuts you, you know, two years and four PhDs of work because now you can actually play with those materials to actually build and characterize it, right? And so that's where I, I'm hopeful. I'm looking forward what AI will look at it and... Um, yeah, interesting, beautiful times to be in. Abs absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you mentioned fear very often, and uh, humans are fear-based, actually. But uh, I don't remember the 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 name of the study. I read one study that said that ninety five percent of our fears never become reality. And with AI currently on the internet, the fear of being replaced is uh, extremely often uh, expressed on social media, and. When I jumped on the ChatGPT train with my podcast in December last year, I also thought at the beginning, why is that cool? Uh, I, I can just let the machine write all text and can lean back and do nothing. And after two weeks, I realized, yeah, it can produce a lot of written text, but meaningless text and mm -hmm. nobody wants to read it. So I thought about how can I use it? And then one influencer said, you use it in the wrong way. See it as a tool, not as a replacement. Mm -hmm. And start asking the right questions. For example, when you have 10 question ideas for your podcast, just ask the uh, tool, how would Lex Friedman ask these questions? Mm -hmm. How would Joe Rogan ask these questions? Mm -hmm. And then you get some ideas and then you can start playing around and spark up your creativity. Or how can I make this headline more attention grabbing? And that's the real use of artificial intelligence. Absolutely. Look, I mean, for me, it's more, we are all influenced by somebody somewhere you know i mean yes some people have this ton of these original thoughts coming in all of us read somewhere and like oh how about that that's a cool thing right so we remember something some people have good memories some people don't um but it's more if it can help you with content or with helping you what you want to achieve and it's a brilliant tool right there's another mm -hmm. tool that i use called audio pen I'm good at talking. I, I'm not good at writing. So I talk into it and it gives me bullet points for me to expand later. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic tool because I can use my phone and record into it and a thought and it saves my original speech. Even with my Indian accent, it transcribes brilliantly. So for me, that is fantastic, right? Rather than me going and saying, oh, I'm bad at writing. I'm going to sit one hour writing. I tried it and obviously it doesn't work. Whereas, you know, when I talk into it and I have my 
my, my flow of thoughts going. It captures my original one, gives me suggestion. I can even have, for me, the best one was there's a drop down to saying um, the writing style of Richard Feynman. And it actually gives you short pithy ones like Feynman. I'm like, oh my God, this is brilliant. Uh, yeah. Feynman's one of my heroes, right? So, so yeah, the, those tools are brilliant, right? But it's not going to replace you. And the replacement theory is, is, is right? Okay, remember how people have these booths, uh, telephone booths, right? Where you, you know, put a coin in, the, you, there's no more anywhere other than London where it's, you know, mm-hmm. showcases, right? But what happened to that industry? What happened to the people who were making those phone booths when cell phones came in? Did somebody worry about, oh, we're replacing them, we shouldn't be using cell phones? Because it was blue collar jobs, sure, we technology evolves, we don't use the telephone, we move on, right? But now people are worried because now it's white collar jobs. Right. I'm like, what if lawyers don't have a job? What will the lawyers do? Right. And then becomes more, why is that now a concern? And it wasn't a concern when the telephone booth operators, manufacturers went out of business. Or yeah. you know, I, w- I would say is it's human augmentation or human enhancement. When I would try <laughs> to use ChatGPT to design a new drug, I would fail. So it's um when I don't have the background, when I don't know what to ask for, when I don't know how to use the tool in my con- in the context of drug development, uh, in the hands of a chemist or biologist, it can work wonders and really enhance their job and make their jobs better. But for someone who never read anything about this uh, this, this special topic, uh, I don't think AI will be of any help. So I don't think that uh, AI itself can design drugs um, on their own without having the input not at this stage that we are at now in my opinion so i was just trying to search there was this one for a first ai drug which went to a phase two trials i don't know what yeah I, th- I think it's uh in city in silicon medicine it was uh alexander uh, yeah, in Syria, Alex, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Savaronkov. he was on my podcast a couple of weeks ago right okay yeah but see he yeah sorry go ahead but he raised 400 million euros from um, Saudi Arabian investors. Aramco, I think, invested in his company. And he's, he has a team working on drug development. So it's not only artificial intelligence. Exactly, right. But it's, it helps him with the, you know, I mean, like, so for, for me, I don't think AI is, is, is a problem right now. Yes, it's probably showing what's the nice side of it, not the ugly side of it. Mm. Um, where I think... Um, there are inherent biases, right? I mean, that will always be there. And I, you know, um, side story, but I'll get to the point. You know how you wash your hands and you've got the IR sensor, right? It never worked for me. I'll put my hand in and I'll be like moving around and it'll never work in, in the early 2000s. And then, you know, the reality was the wavelength in my skin tone didn't uh, match, oh, really? right? It absorbs. So if you're lighter skin, it'll actually work. IR sensors on my skin didn't work. Is it a bias against me? Were they, no, it's just that where it was developed, there was a lot of white folks and a lot less of brown folks to test it, to calibrate it on wavelengths. Now you got a little bit of motion sensor, so I don't look that stupid moving my hand around to get the water going, right? Those biases is not because there is a malicious intent against, oh, you know what? Dark people should not use the faucet, so I'm not going to. No, it's just that you don't think about it because it doesn't apply to you when you built the product and you tested the product. But it's not the bias to 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 discriminate against people if it's just how it happens when you find it you fix it same with band-aids supposed to be on your skin tone now they have different skin tones on band-aids so so those biases will happen because as what your local minima doesn't mean it's the global minima that will change and that will adapt and then the problems come you fix it but not regulated to saying that there'll never be problems that is kind of counterintuitive to technological advances. Either US is going to have all the AI models and they're going to say, I'm not going to give you the models for EU to regulate. And there you find them for having those models. So it's not either way the right mechanism. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just a lot of fear right now. And I, I think um, it's a little bit of an overreach, at least my opinion. The, to build on what you said, the companies just start not to come to Europe anymore when you think about it. I mean, it's not artificial intelligence. It's more a, a consumer product. Uh, Meta started threads, uh, which is basically a Twitter clone so from yeah. what I read on the internet. But I can't use it. It's not in Europe because yeah. of the regulations. Yeah. And the next, uh, I read on LinkedIn that the next um, 
um, a wave of uh, large language models comes to the market. And I think it's cloud AI, which is much better since there's an influencer on uh, than chat GPT, but it's only available in the UK and in the United States. And yes, of course, you can work around with a VPN, but fact is that some companies start ignoring Europe. And I ask myself, I mean, is this bringing us in a bad position because we can't access the latest technology and can start integrating it? How do you see that risk? Well, you know, so for me, it's it's always this, right? If you look back on everything that you regulate, it'll go underground, right? Mm. Um, you, you know, the best that you always quote is what happens in prohibition in the US, right? So they said no more alcohol. It's not like people stop drinking alcohol. It's just that, you know, the people who marketed and did the uh, alcohol sales and manufacture and the whole distribution were done by the mafia. So <laughs> my view is if you regulate something, it's not going to be like, okay, we're not going to stop doing it. Uh, somebody will find a market on how to try it. Either if you want to make sure it's mainstream and it's controlled and whatnot, don't say you do it, that's it. End of the day, you're not going to do it, but find a way to figure out, okay, this is a tool, but here is where the boundary conditions are. Not necessarily saying you have to get this check, my model has to be checked, and that's a little overreach. So if you overreach too much, it'll go underground or people will figure out a VPN to download threads because everybody's sending me invites. I can't get on threads, so I'll have to figure out a VPN. So it's not like it's actually helping. The regulation is not helping people from stop using it. They're just finding a way to go around the regulation and using it. So for me, is the regulation then being effectful? or you're just making people download more VPN tools. And mm -hmm. then you say, oh, you're using VPN, please stop using it. And then you'll find a better VPN to do, Tor or whatever. So it's, I, if the aim is to stop people from being hurt or you know being exploited, um, this regulation is probably not you know, gonna be helpful. It's gonna be hindering, or you're gonna, some people, startups are gonna lose out. If you're a large company, you can pay 50 grand to get your model to be reviewed, but otherwise you're not gonna, you, you're gonna leave. Uh, that's that's not the best ideological. Yeah, that's true, that's true. I just see the time is flying and it's a lot of fun talking to you. Uh, you. We, we have uh, 50 minutes. Let's talk a little bit in the last part of this recording uh, about the future, your future. Uh, what's the future of the Venture Connect program? How do you How do you define the future of it? Um, how do I define the future of it, right? So one is, you know, often people say like, oh, we can't do a different licensing model because it's non existing, right? So for me, it's since I have the opportunity to say, here's a, here's a different way to do it, right? Now for me is to say, this works, right? Because I'm sure a lot of folks, if you see another model, say, ah, oh, this will not work. I'm waiting for them to fail. So for me, I've got a lot more incentive to make this work to say, here's the startups which came in. This is what we did. This is what, so that's going to take some time. The proof is in the pudding. So for me, throwing the kitchen sink behind this program to get more startups using it um, and, and build this up. And that's that's pretty much the immediate future on it, showing how this works. Um, this camera has an auto zoom feature, so it, it zooms <laughs> in and out. So um, forgive me for putting my hand up. Um, what's, what's more, I think is, um, end of the day, this platform is not built for only for CERN. And we what we want is to say, if you're a deep tech startup, I mean, end of the day, is this going to be the same number of VCs, same number of people who can help? I mean, if you want photonics experts, there's going to be 20. If you want a biomedical device or a, you know, or a diagnostic tool, there's going to be 20, 30 good experts who are there, right? And if, it, if it's more to build that ecosystem where it's saying, hey, look, you're not going to use my tech. There's nothing that matches, but what you're building is really awesome. You need to go meet with that person, right? And so that cannot be automated because that's the relationship building part of it where I ask you something without expecting nothing, but to say, okay, you're a nice person. You need to meet that person. That That is what I want a lot more of people to do it. Um, and, and I'm a huge uh, um, believer in building techno-economic analysis models of deep tech startups. What's your CapEx going to be? What's your OpEx going to be? How are you going to manufacture it? What's your unit economics going to be? That's what is missing because everybody's drinking the Kool-Aid of growth, 
you know, I'm going to raise money, burn it, and then we'll figure out customers. And then, oops, I made it work in the lab and I can't get the same price points when I'm manufacturing it. Rather flip it to saying that, okay, I'm going to spend all my time to figure out how I'm going to manufacture at scale, right? If I win the lottery and I have 250 million euros, I can put on it and I get this. Okay, oops, I didn't win the lottery, but let me go to the VCs and say, if you pay me 250, I've got the plan to build this and scale this. Let's go pilot project of 5 million so that we can get to these numbers and then figure out how to scale. And to be honest, that's what the good tech transfer officers should be doing to saying that here's the techno-economic analysis. We've de-risked this part. And then if you ask equity, makes sense. But if you're not and saying, here's an IP which a patent lawyer drafted, we went through prosecution, but I need 40% of your company, that doesn't make sense, right? So there's a lot of change process required. What's future for me is to either for CBC is to build this program to saying this works, right? We, we've talked with experts who de-risk this tech and the VCs invest in it. So it, it's it's the proof in the next year. Yeah, this is absolutely genius what you say. So it's absolutely the, the right way to move uh, companies very fast, very fast forward and get them on the right track early on. It's uh, I think they benefit a lot from you. Oh, cheers, man. Thank you. Um, the, 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 the question that popped up in my mind while you were speaking is, I mean, would creating uh, a venture fund uh, be one of the goals that uh, you could do with the program? And when you have, when, once you have the first three notes, uh, being successful would be a venture fund a thing for you? Uh, look, so <laughs> um, not so much within Sun to have a fund, right? I mean, even in, for me, what would be ideal is something like the engine at MIT. Right. Uh, why I love the engine? They've got a fund. They've got labs access. Right. One of the things that I find a travesty is if you look around Europe, you've got all of these great universities with these great machines, which are one of the kind, but you can't access it. Right. But what if you want to access it? Because most of the funding grants stocks for the equipment, not a person to run it. Right. If if you have access to it and a fund to say, here's a good startup. You've got a fab make a way for, for them, we'll pay for that. That will be my ultimate goal of having like a engine at Europe, right? Uh, which is a fund, which is lab space, which connects you to the ecosystem of every deep tech player in that. Uh, I mean, it helped that they started at MIT and they spun out, um, but that would be phenomenal to have at CERN. Uh, at, at, no, at CERN. I don't think I can pull it out, CERN. but in Europe. Well, I think for me, the biggest challenge is I believe in all science, right? Science just excites me. And then you go and say, what if this works, right? You need a few million to prove it. Um, you need big visionary early stage funds to say that, you know what, that's a moonshot. But if it works, you're going to change this whole trillion dollar industry different, right? Um, there's a startup out of Germany and, and probably also uh, some founders from, uh, from Vienna as well. Um, it's called um, Proxima Fusion. Mm -hmm. They're trying to commercialize the Windows Stein X7, which is the toroidal particle accelerator out of IPP. For me, imagine that is a moonshot, right? Mm -hmm. To build a nuclear fusion sustainable one, which took a million years to million hour, human hours to build it. Those you can't provide validation right now. But now those are like, if this works, it will change the whole energy um industry. It, this this is. This is not taking a share of the market. This is changing the market completely, right? And so those those are phenomenal. There are a lot of visionary, ambitious founders being backed by uh, VCs, which is which is uh, gives hope. I mean, this technology that you mentioned. I mean, if that works, if I remember it right, it's free energy basically for um, forever on the planet. I mean, anything that is perpetual energy, I won't believe it. Just it breaks the laws of physics. What it does is it sustains, <laughs> right? So you've got yeah. other poker marks which are circular, right? Because that was an easier one to build. Mm -hmm. This is like um, a wave pattern which maintains the fusion for longer, right? Mm -hmm. So you can mm -hmm. use there's a ton of ways to create fusion from lasers, which uh, the US group showed was better. But you go to Q greater than one, but you have to sustain it for a longer time. This is a best way to sustain it for a longer time, right? Others don't last for milliseconds, but this lasts longer. So, so these are all parts when you put together, which would make a huge significant difference. But the comparison is Commonwealth Fusion in the US, which has raised $2 billion as a startup, as a spin out of MIT. Two billion. Two billion, right? Oh. 
And in right. Europe, and so, in, what was the fundraise in Europe for the? Uh, they're at a seed stage, right? I mean, you, I mean, I don't think it's fair to compare where Commonwealth Fusion is and where Proxima yeah. is. Yeah. But Proxima raised is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Commonwealth Fusion is where it is going, but it's you know, I mean, a private startup raising two billion is is is, is mind blowing, right? Um, but that's what amount of money is required to make nuclear fusion possible because there's always 30 years coming now. <laughs> So, you know, you need people to write the check for talk about patient capital. That defines me for that. So I have hope for it. Either more investors follow um, and do that here. Um, um, fingers crossed. Now, times, times get better. The first spin out that I worked in was in 2006. It was an Avati spin out with a Series A of 40 million, which was uh, back in this time, 2006, uh, I think the biggest yeah. round in 10 years. And when I hear two billion, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it's not a one round. It's so far they cumulatively raised two billion. But cumulate, I mean, people talk about a billion dollar valuation. Yeah. Uh, this is actual funds of two billion. Uh, that yeah. changes the dynamics a little bit. But probably, uh, probably also milestone based. So it's not a uh, cash. Yeah, based. true. Look, but it's also back at MIT. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's the the, the uh, particle uh, research facilities plus the nuclear research facilities fully. I mean, talk about you know making sure research and the spin out works together. Um, that for me is fascinating and how the model worked and how things work. Um, that's That would be ultimate hope that something like that at, at, at Europe happens. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, yeah. hopefully, hopefully. When I think about the entrepreneurs, very often scientists are first time entrepreneurs and trying to build their first company. Uh, what is the... Uh, advice that you would give them when you just had the chance to give one advice in two minutes? Two minutes. All right, let's go. So for me, it's, you know, always I tell scientists or so turning to entrepreneurs, don't worry about all of this business mumbo jumbo. That's the easy <laughs> part, right? You've already worked out the hardest part that is science, mm. right? You can buy all of those services because there's enough and more people to do it. So, you know, I mean, my throwaway line was if Einstein came to me and saying, ah, equal MC square, kind of nice, but you don't know your cap table, it's kind of ridiculous, right? So you're good at what you do. I don't want you to understand cap table, continue with the science, but here are the people who can help you with, right? If you want the best patent attorney, it's going to cost you only $10,000. You don't have to understand patent law, right? Seek experts outside of your realm, you are good at what you do, you're not good at everything. So find out who can help you and seek those people to, to help you with. The second piece of advice I always give is, you know, I mean, that was something something my, my boss used to do and, and is, and it's now common, right, as well, right? It's like, um, um, good news comes in numbers, bullshit comes in adjectives. Right. I mean, if you ask a good founder, how are you doing? It's like, ah, sales are up 4%. I've got leads going on here. I've raised 12 million. Yeah, that, that, that numbers. If they're not going good, I was going, it's fantastic. We are doing a lot of sales. And, you know, it's always objectives, you know, of rocket ship growth, which means that you don't have numbers on there, right? So always stick with numbers because you're a scientist, you know your numbers well. Stick with what you know and Always say, I don't know when you don't know, because that's the je ne sais pas is probably the biggest lesson I learned. So those three things would probably means that, it, you know, I mean, you might, it sets you up to ask help, but if the glass is always full, you're never going to ask for any other help. And even if you get help, you'll never fill in um, uh, or you'll never absorb. So there's some founders like for us, you know, first startup reshape. Um, uh, founder, ex-staff member, 10 years at CERN, brilliant guy at, you know, reliability engineering. He built the whole fault tracking systems at CERN, maintained it, whatnot. But he came, every time he said something, he'll go like, okay, that's a good idea. I'm going to go try it. For me, that is like phenomenal, right? You're super smart, you're humble, and you got a fire in belly to go through the whole world wrong. I mean, that's like my unicorn. Um, so uh, we, we're throwing everything behind those folks to saying that, how can I help you to be successful? Um, because knowing fully, I should be the footnote. And next time, so this is all the marketing I'm doing now. Next time, if you ask me to come for a podcast, it'll be one of the founders that I want you to talk to rather sure. than me. 
I would be happy to do so. I mean, if right, you have yeah. founders to talk to, I get them on my show. I'm happy to host them. Perfect. Like, I mean, I always stick with what my dad used to say is, you know, the difference between boasting and praising. Mm -hmm. Only difference is who tells it, right? If I mm -hmm. keep on telling I'm great, that's boasting. If a founder tells that, hey, I got help from them, that's praise. And if you ask me what my KPI is, more praises and less boasting. Um, uh, so if more people say, hey, this was good, we got help, um, thanks to them, I did this, or even not that if they're successful and they go refer other people, that's the best validation and that should be the best KPI. And social media and podcasts are the perfect tool to share those success <laughs> stories. Yeah, um, man. If you're standing on a mountain, shout. And thank you for the opportunity to tell everyone what we do. And if you're a startup founder, if you look any tech on our website, feel free to reach out to us. Even if it's not a tech, reach out to us. If you can help, I can help. Else I'll say I can't. Ash, it's really great talking to you. And I'm pretty sure you have in two minutes other, other appointments. Um, let me ask you the final question. Is there anything open in the podcast? Anything that you would like to address? Uh, not really, mate. I mean, for me, you know, I, I think um, two things which I I I hope there are. Um, it, it also changes from people's mindset, right? Um, for me, it's it's you know what a sign we do is fundamental science, right? Fundamental science doesn't translate into products immediately, and that's a very big mindset for people to understand because everybody wants the shiny new thing to say. Ah, why is there not a Facebook or an Instagram coming out of sun, right? But if you look back, I always keep telling the story repeatedly is, you know, started with the CCT, charge couple device to how to store a, uh, how to store a charge. Then that became when CMOS technologies came and became a sensor. Then you can put a lot of sensors behind a phone or, a, you know, into a package that will fit into a phone. And then Apple came or Nokia Ericsson before. And then Apple came in and sold a lot of devices with the camera. And then we all being narcissistic took photos of ourselves and saying, what do I do with all of these photos? I wish there was a place to put this up. Then came Instagram, then became a billion dollar valuation and sold, right? We are at the CCD part. Right. And that was from there to there is 25 years in the making. All of the shiny things happened because there was inventions that enabled it to become a commodity that somebody else can package it and make it to a product where most folks don't go behind that is, oh, how did that sensor work? Who makes that sensor? That's probably a startup, but it's a little bit too much of tech to understand. And people just say, ah, it's too much. Let me just focus on the shiny posting the photograph. There's a ton of science goes behind. The scientists who do that require a lot of credit because they are the two heroes. Voila, done. Two minutes. Absolutely. Completely agree to what you said. I mean, I think also mRNA vaccine, the first components were started in the 50s of the last century. And mm -hmm. deep tech takes time and we need science and scientists to evolve technology and society. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah. uh, cheers, man. I mean, glad to talk with the kindred spread. Um, science is hard and scientists are truly the heroes. And the more we celebrate, we'll get more scientists coming in rather than saying, oh, you're wearing a lab coat and being in somewhere in an ivory tower and you have no reality. We have folks who can actually help us solve all our change challenges from climate change to, to poverty to everything else. There is uh, the only hope I have is on science. Absolutely. I totally agree. Ash, it's a pleasure talking to you. I love your, CBC, your uh, Venture Connect model. And uh, I wish you all the best. And uh, please keep telling people how to track tra tech transfer properly, that more science translates into products, that we can improve society much faster. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. You know, I mean, one thing I do is preach. And now I have to practice what I preach. <laughs> have a great day. <laughs> Bye. You too. Uh, cheers. Have a good weekend. Bye. And there we have it, a deep dive into the world where cutting-edge particle physics meets groundbreaking entrepreneurship. Today with Ash Ravikumar, we explored the vast landscape of CERN Venture Connect, understanding its mission to empower startups with state-of-the-art technologies and a robust network. We also touched upon the challenges and opportunities in the European tech ecosystem, the role of artificial intelligence and the future of deep tech. Thank you for joining us on this enlightening journey. Every episode, every conversation is a step towards a brighter, more innovative future, and we are glad to have you with us. 
if you are tuning in from platforms like Spotify or Apple, a five-star review would mean the world to us. Your feedback not only fuels our passion, but also helps others discover these valuable insights. Sharing is indeed caring. If today's episode sparked a thought or inspired you in any way, don't keep it to yourself. Share it with colleagues, friends, or anyone who might benefit. Your support is what allows us to continue attracting visionaries like Ash, ensuring we keep delivering content that educates and inspires. Stay with us for more episodes and as always, keep pushing boundaries and stay curious. Until next time, keep innovating and transforming the world around you.